Tom Burdett, I'll be chairing the meeting to start. Maxine is a uh, representative grad is at another meeting right now. And we're gonna be looking at H644, an act relating to decriminalization of a personal use supply of a regulated drug. And the first uh, uh, witness we're gonna have is Melissa Story. Hello, thank you for having me everyone. My name is Melissa Story and I'm a person in recovery and the chief operating officer at Recovery Vermont. Recovery Vermont is an organization founded in 1997 as a signature program of the Vermont Association for Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. For over 24 years, Recovery Vermont has served as the hub of all things recovery. And the core of our mission is to celebrate recovery. And as part of that mission, I'm here to strongly support the passage of H644. I'm sure you're wondering why an organization that's dedicated to creating a path of recovery for people with, with substance use disorders would support a bill decriminalizing the use of drugs. Well, at Recovery Vermont, we see the path of recovery as one that is holistic. And you need to take a holistic view of someone's life. And from that holistic view, we can truly meet people where, where they are and understand how they've come to use substances. The barriers and obstacles to recovery, such as lack of housing and employment, lack of access to health care and transportation, lack of childcare, all of those examples constitute much needed connections in people's lives. And recovery is about connection. And that's what's clear to us and what's supported by science and public health is that adding criminalization for drug possession and use in most cases does not support recovery because it makes these connections more and more difficult. In fact, for the Vermonters that we intersect with in the recovery community, it's the criminal, criminalization that looms over them, not as an adequate deterrent to their use, but as a deterrent to addressing the underlying issues that have led them to use substances. Criminalization creates more barriers and takes away the vital connections needed to get help. In fact, if we're taking a true harm reduction approach, which to me is the most humane approach we can take for addressing drugs and drug use, we would never utilize criminalization for drug use or possession of drugs, as it's the engagement with the criminal justice system that introduces additional harm and reduces the paths and the chances to health and recovery. I wanted to point out that Recovery Vermont really supports the way that this bill has been drafted. In particular, we support the makeup of the Drug Use Standards Advisory Board. We think it's essential <clears throat> to have a diverse group of voices at the table, including voices of impacted people as part of the process of determining how the law will apply to them. And this bill provides for that. The provision is an innovative way to incorporate the ideas of those with lived experience, which will hopefully lead to the development of policies that have had the greatest possible public health impact. We also support the bill providing people with an option of either paying a $50 fine or calling Vermont Help Link. Keeping this fine relatively low is important for the many that struggle economically while allowing the fine to be completely waived if a person seeks assistance through Vermont Help Link, this can provide an opportunity for people to access health and treatment services. Substance use disorder is a health condition and should be treated as such. And relapse can be part of this health condition. People struggling with substances should be offered the same amount of tolerance as say a diabetic who can't stop eating sugar. People with diabetes aren't shamed by their health care provider for not sticking to a perfect diet. Instead, they're seen by their doctor, perhaps referred to a nutritionist or given medication to get their blood sugar back, at, back to normal. 
they're met with compassion and given another chance to get their health back on track. And that is exactly how we should be treating people who struggle with substances. In my own recovery journey, it took several attempts before I finally was able to get into recovery and turn my life around. Every time someone told me that I was a bad person because I couldn't stop drinking, it set me back tenfold and it made it seem impossible to change. I really wanted to stop drinking for years and it just felt like no one understood where I was coming from or what I was going through. But finally, someone did something different. They met me with love and compassion and understanding. And this was all it took to create a little sliver of hope that made me feel like I was worthy of another chance at life. This encounter made all the difference. I got my health back. I went back to school. I started my own business. I volunteered in my kid's classroom. I learned the meaning of gratitude and the importance of being in service to others. And all of this was due to having someone take the time to listen to me, to see me and to connect me to the recovery supports that I needed at the time. And this was a decade ago before Vermont had the thriving recovery community that it has now. We're really lucky to have a state and a de department of health that believes in recovery from the hub and spoke system to placing recovery coaches in every hospital emergency department around the state. Vermont has a wealth of support to draw from when someone's in need. Overall, Recovery Vermont is excited to be supporting this forward thinking legislation and to have the conversation about continuing to move Vermont's policy toward one of humanity, harm reduction and compassion. Thank you for listening and for your attention to this important issue. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Melissa. Any questions, Martin? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Story. Um, it's very helpful. Uh, I think I need you to reiterate, I, I'm not sure I caught it. Uh, that's the problem with trying to multitask. I was trying to look at the bill. Uh, did you say a, a concern that I have is whether we are prepared in Vermont uh, at this point to be able to address uh, drug use, or I should say, uh, um, substance use disorder uh, through the health care um, system that we have now. I know that, you know, I, I understand the definite difficulties in dealing with the, the criminal justice system, putting that aside, but what needs to be done to bolster, or, or am I wrong? Are, are we in a position where we can uh, address this solely through the health care system? Uh, if not, are there any suggestions on, on what is needed to try to bolster that system? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think we are definitely not there yet, although um, there are new programs and new initiatives happening like so frequently now. It's really encouraging. Um, a couple that come to mind are rapid access to medication, which has been <clears throat> happening for a little while now, um, but people can go to their emergency department and immediately attain um, buprenorphine or medicine that they need in order to start their recovery. This is 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, and then they're, they're followed up with. Um, this is also happening in um, the, if somebody has an alcohol use disorder, people are you know, helping give them the medication that they need, the wraparound services that they need um, in an immediate fashion. But I think when it comes to you know, expanding these services, I think what needs to happen is, you know, just not as many silos and, you know, the more we can show that this is a healthcare issue, um, you know, it's one where, where it, 
it it requires a, many voices at the table, and um, you know it it's hit it it doesn't discriminate. So um, I think that we have a ways to go, but I also think that we're really lucky to have a lot of the um, you know immediate access to recovery um, that we do here in Vermont. Yeah, a second unrelated question, and I'm not sure how this fits in with this. Uh, but so, are, are all are, are all this is probably a dumb question. But I'm going to ask it anyway. Are, are all users of uh, of these various drugs that are illegal? Are they all in need of recovery? Is kind of one question I have. And is there some way to address a situation where an individual? doesn't necessarily need to be in recovery. Does that make any sense? I, I mean, I, I know that there could be recreational drug users who really are suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, I don't know if you can comment on that or if that made any sense at all. Um, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, yes, people, not everyone who uses drugs has a substance use disorder. That's correct. Right, and is there, a, should we be treating individuals with substance use disorder or versus people who just occasionally recreationally use uh, drugs uh, any differently? I mean, if we were in the healthcare realm, I know we don't really do that. Uh, well, we kind of do that in the criminal justice realm, but if we were just doing this through the healthcare system, I, maybe that's just too out there as far as a question. I just... Right, I know, because it's there's such a there's such a difference between somebody who's using rec rec recreationally and somebody with a substance use disorder. And it's hard, um, it's hard to know that when, if, if one of these people is in their doctor's office, say, it's hard to tell if, if somebody has um, a substance use disorder. So, um, you know, I think treatment should be widely available to everyone. And uh, regardless of if they have a longstanding substance use disorder or not. So, so I, I, you know, in our criminal justice system, uh, if somebody is, gets caught with a misdemeanor level of uh, drugs, uh, drugs that would lead to a misdemeanor, they're, they're automatically in most cases uh, diverted to treatment and it seems in that situation, they're diverted to treatment, whether they have substance use disorder or they just happen to be caught of because they were out partying some, some evening. Uh, so there, there isn't really any distinctions in our current system. I was just kind of wondering if there could be in the other system, but I, I appreciate your answers to the question. Thank, thank you. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Great, thank you, Melissa. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question on the screen, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, I wanna just thank you so much for your very thoughtful and articulate testimony and for being so generous with your personal, sharing your personal story. I, it's, those are the stories that make a difference, so thank you. Um, I, I just, you talked about it a fair amount in your testimony, but I just wondered if there's anything else you want to add about the kind of barrier that, you know, we know about some of the collater collateral consequences that come with justice system involvement, um, things like lack, lack of access to housing and employment. So th that, that's very well documented, but I'm wondering if you have any other final thoughts you wanna offer us just about the way that stigma itself becomes a barrier and the way that criminalization kind of contributes to stigma around. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, we, we do a lot of work. We train recovery coaches at Recovery Vermont. And we have a specific training where our recovery coaches work with people who are coming out of corrections and reentry. And we, at these trainings, we always have people with lived experience of being incarcerated. And the stigma is something from being 
incarcerated um, for drug use or possession. Um, just the stigma just follows them their entire life and just makes it so difficult for them to feel like they can become a member of society again. Not only is it the stigma externally, you know, from just trying to get a job and seeing that they have a felony on their record or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but it's the internal stigma that really can take somebody completely away from, you know, every, everything. It, it, it's the internal stigma that is so incredibly damaging and disconnecting. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that it's, you know, it's unfortunate that so many people have these types of records that they are trying to deal with and trying to uh, re-enter life. Um, and it makes it really hard. And we just need to be as compassionate as we can be with these people because uh, they certainly deserve a, a second chance or another chance. Thank you. I really appreciate Really appreciate your answer. Are there any other questions for Melissa? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm appreciate sorry. your testimony. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed you. your testimony. Um, but now they get to watch it with YouTube, which is really a nice, nice COVID silver lining. So thank you. So is Mr. Oh, there it right, Mr. Franklin. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, it's really great to see all of you. And uh, my testimony today, uh, so I'm, uh, my name's Daniel Franklin. I'm the Vice President for Advocacy and Community Relations and get to work with Melissa, which is uh, such an honor. And I came in today, today knowing that, uh, you know, nothing that I could say in sort of a formal testimony could be as powerful as what Melissa had to share. And so I'm just really honored uh, and thankful that uh, Melissa uh, told her story and and shared uh, what our organization believes about uh, this bill um, and appreciate all of your questions. As I, uh, my, my testimony is gonna be a little uh, less formal uh, in the sense that I just wanna kind of respond to a couple of thing, questions that were asked. And, um, you know, I think uh, I look around the room and see, uh, you know, Representative Rachelson, who worked at, you know, Lund for so long, and Representative Colburn, who's been such a, a huge supporter of harm reduction and overdose prevention sites, and and uh, and um, Representative Christie and Kaya, who have done incredible work on equity and, and just uh, in, important work uh, to create a level playing ground for people around the state, and Jay Diaz from the ACLU and Representative Donnelly, Donnelly a, a social worker. Um, it strikes me that this is a, a really amazing committee to be doing this work and that it's uh, a remarkable thing just for you to be having this conversation about um, you know, about the gradations uh, of decriminalization and, and sort of how our system deals with um, substance use and possession and things of that nature. And there are, of course, uh, other bills that are sort of around the same issue, not just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, gradations between misdemeanors and felonies and so forth. Um, I wanted to you know, this, uh, the, the question was about, you know, the medical, the, you know, treating substance use disorders within the medical system. And it would be really nice if the medical system was the only place that we uh, care for people or have to care for people uh, with substance use disorders. But the reality is that ships passed and people are, uh, crim our criminal justice system is, uh, you know, overrun with uh, people with substance use disorders who uh, have this hanging over them for the rest of their life. I think of um, my work for four years, I was the director of the uh, of North Central Vermont Recovery Center in, in Loyal County. And 
you know, fully half of everyone uh, that the Lamoille Restorative Center served had a substance use disorder, 20%, 27% had an opioid use disorder, um, you know, and uh, there's so many, no, you know, nodes within our um, our system of care uh, that are affected by um, the way that we have created punitive measures, uh, which are unequally, uh, you know, there's been recent reports about um, racial inequity in terms of uh, traffic stops and searches and seizures and other other forms of inequities within the system um, related to substance use and possession. Um, so again, I just want to thank, you know, um, Chair Grad and your whole committee um, for taking up this issue. Um, mostly wanted to say I'm a resource for all of you. Uh, we'll, you know, continuing to work, uh, you know, Representative Colburn and I sit on a couple of committees together, which is, which is uh, wonderful. And uh, all of our work together, um, it's in the medical system. It's in the, um, it's, in the recovery community, it's in the treatment centers, it's in a lot of different uh, nodes within the system. Um, and inevitably it's tied to issues of inequity in terms of um, how uh, how people are treated and the, and the stigma around substance use. Um, and uh, so if there's ever anything that I can do on behalf of our organization to answer questions or, or help to, um, you know, provide information around this issue. I'm very happy to do so. Um, I see Representative Colburn has a, a question. I'd love to love to hear that or or a comment. Well, thank you. Go, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I don't want to cut off your. So, if you had more to say, um, no, I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Just, I, I mean, I I guess I wanted to dig in a little bit more to Representative Malone's question earlier about. Um, this question of, you know, like, do we need the criminal justice system for now to be the place where we're intervening with folks who might be struggling with their drug use because we're not adequately resourced in the health system? It's just, that doesn't seem like what I've heard, but I as someone, I mean, you're right that we've embedded a lot of things in a lot of different systems out of necessity, really. But um, yeah, I just like to hear your, I just like to hear you weigh in on that question as well, you know, do. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, this is, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you my personal opinion, which is, you know, and I think that the evidence would back this up, but, um, you know, it's less statistically based than just what I've observed. So I think that um, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, whether it's the stigma or the laws around substance use and possession have, have resulted in uh, a lot of people going, uh, being incarcerated for, uh, for essentially having a substance use disorder or being, um, you know, it could be anything. It could be that one time that somebody went to a party and had some something in their possession and would just, you know, wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong things in that moment. Or it could be a lifelong battle. You know, there's so many uh, different um, ways that this manifests. Um, what I would say is that, um, and kind of what I was trying to get at is that our criminal justice system has been slow to react to the fact that people that that there are a very significant number of people in our uh, prison system who are there partially related to uh, substance use. At one time, 75% of all of the women um, that were in the South Burlington correction in the women's correctional facility um, had either one of two, uh, e either a substance use uh, related offense uh, or possession related offense or and or were uh, survivors of sexual or domestic violence. There's a huge crossover there, um, you know, and uh, our system has been very slow to react to, um, you know, what has happened. Um, 
Melissa mentioned that recovery coaches, there's a program in Rutland, um, which has really pioneered this, to um, provide services in the Rutland Correctional Facility, um, where coaches engage with people um, while they're still incarcerated, try to build a bridge back to uh, services out in the community, engage with people while they're back out in the community. And there, it has dropped recidivism rates dramatically. Um, you know, there's a very high recidivism rate for people within the first six months um, and often related to recurrences of substance use. Um, unfortunately, um, because of the sort of uncomfortable um, partnership between um, our correctional system and, and its funding models and the independent contractors who run these correctional facilities, especially out of the house, uh, out of the um, out of state, um, we like recovery coaches and, re and recovery centers and other services have not been made available uh, within the correctional system. And therefore we can't help to do that work um, when we would be more than happy to do that. Um, people who would like to offer meetings within the correctional facilities have not been allowed to do that. And as you know, I'm sure uh, it was very, very difficult to, even once it was legally allowed to um, and encourage to provide medication assisted treatment within the uh, within the criminal justice system and there were lots of ways where um, our our systems fed recidivism essentially setting people up to fail so they would either go back to jail and to your point representative Colburn like housing is a major major issue you know, we uh, if we don't prepare people to go back into their communities and have both housing and the supports that they need um, around the particular things that went that caused them to be incarcerated in the first place, then I'm not sure why we expect a different result. Um, and the fact is, there are people in jail at this moment um, who are there because they uh, didn't meet the Department of Corrections uh, requirements around quote unquote safe housing. Um, but if we don't give them the res if we don't have the resources or give the resources for somebody to have a quote unquote safe home um, that doesn't have substances where they're not with the same people, places and things, um, then I'm not sure it's kind of a we're kind of putting them into a catch-22 there. Um, we find people come back to our communities um, without the supports that they need. Um, and, you know, the whether it's recovery centers or recovery coaches or, um, you know, other service providers try to create some kind of safety net, but it's often sort of um, come a little too little too late. Um, we'd rather um, have a bridge back to communities and create connections. It's connections that are going to um, really solve these issues. Um, so sorry for the, the political soapbox, but that it's kind of, uh, you know, that's, that's what we've got. Um, yeah. You're in a political environment, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What other, uh, any, any other questions or? Yeah, I do see um, uh, Barbara. Thank you. So thank you for your testimony. I, I, I know that some of my colleagues are thinking because of some of the questions from the other day, if we minimize um, how we treat people using drugs and don't send them off, to uh, court and possibly prison, that people won't, that we're saying it's okay and that people won't seek um, treatment. Can you talk a little bit about your experience? Because I know you have way more experience um, working with people who struggle certainly than I do and I haven't been doing this work for a couple of years. Um, but it would be helpful, I think, for people to have context of does prison and um, court make a difference? So what I'll say, uh, you know, I don't I, I don't think it's fair to entirely throw out the idea of risk. Uh, um, 
of restorative justice and the fact that, you know, some people, it saves their lives if they can be kind of removed from their situations uh, and break a cycle. Um, you know, I don't know the percentages. I don't know the data around that. Um, I think that um, drug courts have been extraordinarily uh, successful relative to, um, to prisons themselves. Um, I guess, you know, the, the thing that immediately popped to my mind when you asked that question was quite simply, it's, you know, jails or prisons, correctional facilities are not healing environments. They do not provide services. If you were put in an eight by eight cement box um, for a while with other people who um, you know, are triggering, um, I don't think very many people come out better than they were when they went in. Um, and when they're denied their rights and their services like recovery coaching, like supports, like meetings, like anything that would help them um, um, to be better prepared to come back out into the world, um, then that then then we're inevitably, um, you know, we're 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 further injuring them. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, um, and again, I'm expressing stronger opinions than I was planning on going going into this, but the reality is, like, substance use is 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 uh, well, again, there are gradations from severe substance use disorders down to recreational use. And it's not fair to treat all of those things the same. But but when we are talking about long-term entrenched substance use that leads someone into um into incarceration, you know, it's 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 hard to deny the the reality that a very large percentage of these people as exemplified by what's happened at the Burlington Correctional Facility um, with, with the cross-section of women with um, co-occurring um, mental health and substance use uh, who have histories of uh, as survivors of sexual and domestic violence, um, you know, that's just one subset of that population. If we don't do, and this applies also to the treatment facilities, uh, I will say as well, if we don't grapple with mental health and with underlying, uh, whether it's ch adverse childhood experiences or the traumas that people have uh, uh, experienced that led them possibly in, in, these in some of these cases, to use substances to um, self-medic, I mean, there's a lot of ways that people put it, but self-medicate or to numb the pain or, you know, any number of uh, responses to their traumas. If we don't address those things, then we're in fact causing, we're putting them in greater danger than they were in before. Because if you get, you know, you think of a, an inpatient treatment facility or a short, short term jail stay, maybe they have succeeded in, um, in, in getting them quote unquote sober or abstinent and taking away the substances. But if that is a coping mechanism for somebody and then they no longer have that, First of all, it brings all of that to the surface and they have to deal with that and it's gonna come out in some form. Um, and, you know, again, people build up resilience, but, you know, it, it, it's not always possible to do that. And then secondly, um, we're dealing, we're, we're, we're in a time when um, even recreational drug use is more dangerous than it's ever been in the history of mankind, of humankind. You know, we've got fentanyl in at least 88% of all fentanyl, of all overdoses. In fact, in the year 2021, the data shows that it was a 100% uh, of, of, of fatal overdoses linked to opioids. Um, you know, even recreational use uh, can be deadly, and if you take if you make someone opioid naive within a correctional setting or another setting, and then they do re experience a relapse uh, or a recurrence of a substance use disorder, um, then they're much more likely to pass away from it. Um, and 
you couple that with the isolation of uh, having a criminal record, um, you couple that with the current circumstances around COVID and the fact that more people are using by themselves um, and are cut off from others. Um, and we've got a really particularly deadly cocktail uh, of risk factors. Um, so I say all this to say that we have a really robust recovery system. Melissa is also the director of training and they have trained, you know, a hundred, almost a hundred ICNRC certified recovery coaches, uh, some 500 recovery coaches around the state. We've got, you know, all of our mental health and SUD workforce at play, um, but there is something, there is a missing link that is occurring with, whether it's with our correctional system, our judiciary system, our uh, treatment facilities, even the medical nodes that is uh, is amplifying the risk factors and and is is a pretty significant uh, contributor to how many people have passed away and it's really really important to note that you know the 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 legislature does play a huge role right now in being you know like I was <laughs> in, in the as a director, like I was deeply involved in the emergency department recovery coaching program. And for the entire years of 2019 and 20, um, some 90 plus percent of all of the people who went to the emergency department for a substance use was, it was actually alcohol. Um, over time, it's increased for cocaine, crack cocaine, methamphetamines, benzos and alcohol, um, benzodiazepines and other substances but alcohol is a huge factor as well. And an example of a really injurious uh, thing that happened was that the legislature allowed, um, uh, you know, allowed uh, like curbside alcohol sales and now even contemplating delivery of alcohol, um, which is to say it's not all opioids. It's a lot of substances that are driving what's happening. Um, so I'll just, I'll conclude on that, uh, for, for that, that question. Does that, did I, is that a good answer to your question, um, Representative Rachelson? Um, yeah. yep, thank you. Daniel, I don't know if this is for you or Melissa, cause you brought up her with their, uh, with the recovery coach training, but I'm just wondering if it's a uniform system throughout the state, if it's the same and. Montpelier is, is it is in Rutland as far as training recovery coaches go. I'll let Melissa answer that. <laughs> yes, thank you for that question. Yes, it is. We are the training hub for recovery coaches in the state. So everybody goes through our um, 46 hour mm -hmm. recovery coach academy. They have to already be working in the field of recovery under supervision. So, but they all do re receive the same training. So, and to build on what Melissa is saying, and I think something that might be really pertinent to what you're asking about is that um, everybody receives the core, same core academy, but what Mo Recovery Vermont and Melissa and her team are doing um, increasingly is preparing um, recovery coaches for any number of settings, whether it's the correctional institutions, whether it's drug courts, whether it's, uh, we've got specialized training for the emergency department, we've got special, we've got, um, you know, we're really uh, expanding the repertoire to be able to place coaches in lots of different settings for those unique environments. And also to, um, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe Melissa, you could give the percentage, but a substantial number of the recovery coaches who are trained actually work at uh, what we call uh, recovery adjacent um, organizations like treatment facilities um, or um, or like uh, groups of clinicians, um, lots of different settings, which is a really, in my mind, an essential piece of, of 
helping to deal with some of our workforce issues. So like, uh, you know, some of these, in, these organizations will employ recovery coaches who are not your, um, your really expensive uh, nurses, really expensive uh, licensed clinicians, but they are highly trained recovery coaches who can provide some very significant supports in those settings that, uh, and, and a lot of those, or not a lot, but some of those folks will go on to get, um, become licensed alcohol and drug counselors or social workers or other types of professionals. So um, increasingly we're, we're working on trying to use recovery coaching as, as a major force within the, within the workforce uh, to help address uh, what's going on. So, so, and I should probably know this, but so does Recovery Vermont oversee all the recovery coaches in the state on some level? So yes, we we were we oversee their training. Um, if they are a certified recovery coach, they will have to go through a certain amount of continuing education training in order to keep their certification. So in that sense, we absolutely oversee them. Um, since there are recovery coaches in all sorts of different areas, like Daniel was alluding to, um, whether it's a recovery center or a treatment center, um, they coaches would be under supervision at their the center where they work or volunteer. So uh, take Turning Point in Rutland for an example since I'm from that area. Um, so is there somebody in, in uh, Turning Point that's uh, qualified to do the recovery coach training? Is that the way it works? They, they send their people to us to be trained, okay. to Recovery Vermont to be trained. And then within the recovery center there, they have somebody who is trained to supervise them in their recovery coaching. Okay, great, great. Because I know Turning Point does a, a great job down there with that. Yes, oh, they, they do. do. Yeah. <laughs> they're and they're I, amazing. I'm bragging, bit, I'm bragging a little bit because my nephew works there. So. <laughs> <laughs> That is so neat, and and um and another piece of this there is uh that the um it's not just the academy. There are all sorts of other trainings that Recovery Vermont provides, and the CEUs for the International Certification and Reciprocity Consortium IC and RC certified coaches, um, which is sort of the uh, the next step up. Um, the so those trainings um include things like um uh boundaries and ethics and um, uh, all, all sorts, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting them all, but um, maybe Melissa can weigh in, but there's just many of them. Yeah, our, I would say a significant amount of training uh, they receive is in motivational interviewing, which is an evidence-based practice of it's the art of deep listening and helping to um, move somebody's inner ambivalence, helping them move through their ambivalence in order to um, make change in their life. And, I, and then, yeah. Yeah, and then we have all, all sorts of really interesting um, continuing education opportunities for coaches. Um, some of which, you know, we are, we work with the people where our coaches are um, are working or volunteering. So say the recovery centers, we work closely with the directors there to, to see what they need in order uh, for us to create a training. Um, you know, with it's really important to to hear for these people and support these people who are boots on the ground giving service to um to people in need every day, we listen to what they need for training and then we develop those trainings at Recovery Vermont to keep coaches really on their toes. And if I can just kind of build a bridge back from that to uh, what Representative Rachelson asked and, and I think a, a really uh, central point of, of this conversation is that, um, 
this is this is a way recovery coaches are one of many paths to uh to bring greater equity and access to resources no matter what phase somebody is at you know we we have to be real about this like not everyone that uses substances or has a substance use disorder is ready at all times to accept or seek help and that's just the way it is that's going to exist no matter what you know what uh, laws or or recriminations or stigma we put in place. Um, the reality is people have to be uh, ready for uh, to seek help and to get help. Um, and there are lots of different forms of help. Um, but you know we always say like where there's life there's hope. And our goal is to keep people alive and to give them access and to never give up. And um, you know, so uh, no matter what somebody has done or no matter what somebody has been through, no matter what substances they use, uh, whether they're ready or for help or not, our job is to be there and ready for them when they are. Um, and um, I think that um, whether we, you know, change drug classifications or decriminalize or um, sort of take a less punitive approach as a society. The real re, the the reality is we have to create a more trauma informed system, and we have to be ready for 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 folks when they're ready for us. And um, and and we have to be equity minded. I mean, it's a really important uh, you know. There, you know, we, we have to build up, uh, whether it's in recovery coaches or in other settings, a group of people who represent the people that we serve, you know, that can um, be prepared to connect with people in, in, in any setting. Um, and so it's, it's ongoing. It's, a, it's going to be a long journey. There's no easy solutions. Um, but our, inevitably, our our judiciary system, our correctional system, our treatment facilities, our community-based providers, we all have to kind of do a little bit better and and uh, and not just uh, have these siloed nodes, but an integrated system, uh, a no wrong door approach. And we're never going to solve the problem if we just focus on um, substance use. If we know that housing and uh, food insecurity and uh, all these other basic, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the basic things that all humans want and need um, are are just as important as whether somebody uses substances or not. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a phrase that goes kicks around in the state house often, which is uh, don't let the, and it's not just in the state house, but don't let the perfect stand in the way of the good. And that's kind of where this question is going to kind of come from. It's looking at relative harms. And I know there's all sorts of issues of harm in dealing with this issue. There's the issue of harm uh, to individuals who have substance use disorder who are not able to find recovery opportunities. And that's, that's uh, how much we're funding uh, recovery and treatment and, and making sure that we have that available. But I wanna look specifically at the harm uh, of the criminal justice system right now and relative harms. So the uh, bill uh, would have a civil penalty and presumably it's still to have that civil penalty, there'll be some involvement of law enforcement uh, who would be providing that ticket. So, so there's an interaction with law enforcement. In this case, it's with a civil penalty. Uh, in the other bill, um, 505, it is a misdemeanor. Uh, we're trying to make it more of a misdemeanor instead of a felony. There's also the options, certainly a felony. But that's kind of one area where there may be differences in harm, but it seems, you know, is there really a difference if it's an interaction with law enforcement? That's kind of one question I have, but I'm going to go ahead and just ask the other question. As far as the amount of harm that we have if we have a misdemeanor where we have a presumption of diversion into treatment uh, as opposed to a felony where the chances of incarceration are higher, you know, what's the levels of harm I know there's harm in even the interaction with law enforcement, or tell me if there is, isn't, but, uh, but 
I'm trying to understand, you know, if, if we move to misdemeanors mostly for possession, have we taken care of a chunk of harm? You know, if we move to civil penalties as opposed to misdemeanors, have we dealt with that again? If we move completely away from law enforcement, I mean, can you comment on that as far as, you know, that the, the relative harms, you know, what we might be able to get done, if that is helpful, what we can get done, et cetera? That, and, and that's open to either Mr. Franklin or, or Ms. Story. And, and if uh, uh, Ms. Morris and uh, Mr. Diaz want to weigh in on that concept, uh, I'd appreciate it. Melissa, did you have any thoughts on that or? I was going to defer to you since this has okay. been more of your area. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I'm, 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 really, really interested to see what Ms. Morris and Mr. Diaz have to say, because I think that, um, you know, I'm not a legal expert, but what I think is that um, I think what I've been trying to get across is that there's a way to build more compassion and empathy and, and resource provision into our system in a way that is uh, it's not enabling, it's not um, ignoring, it's not, um, it's also not, uh, um, I mean, my initial thought and our, our official position is like, yes, I, I love the, the concept of say a $50 um, civil penalty, but if you go get uh, treatment that, or if you go, if you go see, seek help of some kind um, that you, uh, that that's erased. I <laughs> I don't know this the cynic in me I guess wonders whether fifty dollars is going to do it whether like you know is it you know if they if they get out of a fifty dollar civil penalty but then they have to go pay one hundred and fifty for a, a a counseling session have we really have we really done anything for them if they don't have health insurance, if they don't have, you know, the basic things that they need to even get the help that we're talking about, if they don't have transportation, I mean, I mean, I know we're, I, I'm getting into other things, but like, there are some really basic barriers and obstacles. And I've, um, and I don't want to get didactic, and I'm going to try to really keep this brief. But one thing I often try to explain to people in the human services system, uh, so when I was at the recovery center, uh, somebody from, say, the AHS from the field office who was trying to, you know, there, it was this building and they had economic services and they had um, reach up and they had all of these programs, right, all in one building, voc rehab, whatever. And they would say, you know, why doesn't this person come get help or why don't they, you know, why don't they uh, fill out this paperwork, they would get X, Y, or Z thing. And I said, like, <clears throat> you have to understand how uh, trauma and institutional marginalization and substance use affects the brain and the processes through which a person interacts uh, with with our system. Often there's a lot of uh, alienation from um, from the community and from the resources available to a person. They've felt let down by, um, you know, the judgments they've gotten in different parts of the system. You know, they go, they go to get financial help and the person says, well, you know, you'd be fine if you just stopped using substances and got a job, you know, you know, the, the stigma has caused them to be uh, alienated. But besides that, just from a neurobiological sense, uh, substance use, especially long-term uh, entrenched substance use, changes a person and how they uh, how they process information. Um, I think a lot of us here at this table, we can think of many many things co uh, concurrently and in and simultaneously, and we can say, okay, I have fifty things to do. What is you know I can do you know, these things all at once, or I can do these things in a row and it'll get, have X result. When you have a, you know, there, there are some biological reasons why it's a lot harder to deal. We, we, I call it kind of system overload. When you have so many things to do, when somebody's asking you to, 
to go to a counselor and go to economic services and go to voc rehab or uh, DOL to apply for a job or get benefits or any number of things, it's very, very overwhelming. And, it, and a lot of people don't know where to start. They're intimidated by the system, afraid of judgment. Um, and I'm not saying that that's anybody's fault in particular, but the reality is our system is not as easy to navigate as we think it is. Even as a provider uh, for a long time, it was hard for me to, you know, by the end of my tenure as a recovery center director, I had to be an expert in housing and transportation and uh, food uh, resources and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and recovery coaches, we always say their job is to listen and provide resources. Like they, they're professional navigators, but it is not easy. And to try to bring this home on what you were asking, I, I would like to think <clears throat> that avoiding a, a civil penalty, avoiding a cost would be a, a reason, you know, that we would like to think that that would compel somebody to go get, uh, to go do something else. Um, but the reality is probably more complex than that. I don't know that for sure. I don't want to say that categorically, but I think you will see some, some situations where people just aren't equipped to kind of think in, that, in those binary terms of, hey, I, or, or they may just say maybe $50 is more worthwhile for, you know, because they can't conceive of changing the way things are. Um, I, you know, I think we just, we have to build a more robust system that meets people where they're at and, and, it, and accepts that um, it is not a binary state of using or not using of addiction or not of, um, you know, we just, we like to think in black and white and there's, there's just everything in between, um, you know, and I, I hope I've, I hope I've addressed it, but I, I don't think it's a bad idea. Some people, it might help, but the reality, but, but people are more complex than that. And I'm just not sure that avoiding a $50 fine is going to be quite the, the carrot or the stick that, um, that we think it might be. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bob, and then we're going to take a break. Oh, I don't mean to interrupt break time here, but thank you, Melissa and <laughs> Daniel, for uh, coming. It sounds like a really great program that you have, and uh, the recovery coaches seem to be a, a great asset to your, your program here. Uh, what I was wondering was, under what circumstances do you come into contact with the majority of folks that need your help? Is it a walk-in service? Is it through the criminal justice system? How do you offer these folks your program and how do they get to you? Sure, Daniel, do you want me to answer that? Uh, yeah, yeah, please, if you, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, there's, there's a, a variety of different ways that people would encounter a recovery coach. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we have them in every emergency department, so, um, <clears throat> If you know that is a, a really great program that has expanded over the past three years, going on four now, um, where if somebody shows up to the emergency department and has been screened for um, substance use disorder, then they'll meet with a recovery coach and follow up with them for 10 days. Um, they might walk into a recovery center and ask for recovery coach services. Um, we have recovery coaches who come to our training who work in a lot of the designated agencies around the state. We have recovery coaches who are currently working with law enforcement. And so um, this is really an exciting program where we uh, are really looking forward to um, seeing how that has is going to be developed so far, it's it's working really well. Where a recovery coach will be paired up with um, a police officer, and um, and you know, if somebody's experiencing substance use disorder, 
they will have a coach right there to meet them where they're at. Um, and they're actually speaking together, the coach and this police officer that I'm thinking about at recovery day this year on February 16th. Um, so there's a variety of different ways and places where one could encounter a recovery coach. They can always um, contact us and we can place them, help place them with a coach in their area. Vermont Help Link is another area or place where um, they refer people to recovery coaching, all of the recovery centers. Daniel, what else am I missing here? Yeah, no, I, I mean, you covered it and really the sky's the limit here. I mean, we could, can, you know, we, we can continue to train coaches and put them in lots of different settings. The limitation is what the or what the what the settings themselves want to do. Um, but every you know the recovery centers are a big employer. A lot of different um, providers. Um, it, uh, as, as Melissa said, um, you know, we do have a few uh, pilot programs with uh, law enforcement and um, trying to train, um, for example, the Vermont State Police or local police departments. There's the correctional system, but I think, you know, I hope that in some some someday we're gonna uh, we're gonna have recovery coaches who can go into every correctional facility in the state of Vermont. To me, uh, you know, that's that's a big area of potential growth. And um, you know, right now there's a lot of conversation around embedding social workers with uh, with law enforcement. Um, but I think. Uh, and, and sort of mental health professionals. I think recovery coaches could also be uh, one of those resources. Um, like uh, there's a couple of, uh, for example, in Addison County um, right now, you know, because we don't have, we are not well enough resourced uh, to have, for example, uh, a recovery coach embedded at the police departments or sheriff's departments. Um, what they did is they provided the police squad cars with uh, iPads. And if a police officer encounters someone who has overdosed or had another uh, substance use related issue, um, then they, um, they can bring it up uh, right in real time. And the, the, the person that they're working with can talk to a coach um, back at the Turning Point Center. So there's so many different models that could, that it could, could occur here. Um, we just have to invest in them and really try to um, look at what works. Oh, just to follow up real quickly. So it sounds as though uh, rather than our judicial system or law enforcement, uh, creating harm to these individuals that they are an integral part of the mission that you're trying to accomplish just by working with them hand in hand with these programs and with these iPads. And I assume that the, I don't say the majority, but a lot of these folks come to you for this help and for this assistance through the law enforcement agencies that you work cooperatively with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been, I think COVID has actually pushed the envelope on this a little, but law enforcement and um, emergency personnel, EMTs, um, but uh, to, to hone in on your exact point, there is a lot of benefit if a person does not feel cornered by a law enforcement officer, but rather feels that that person cares about them enough to at least offer them resources. For example, one other thing that we did was to get harm reduction packs uh, and Narcan into the hands of law enforcement and just simply the act of not uh, of of wanting to save their life and uh, and like say a, you know sometimes it will be a, an interaction and a person um you know the the cop ha or the, the the law enforcement officer has a limited amount of time to interact with a person but if they can just give them some resources some harm reduction packs some narcan whatever the situation might be it can totally change their trajectory feeling that that somebody cared for them uh, and they weren't being punished but rather um, that th that those law enforcement officers simply wanted to save their lives and help them and some Sometimes in the moment, it'll seem like they don't, uh, you know, that the, the person who is on the receiving end of this might not be in the, in, in a, you know, fully 
you know, you might, may not receive it in the best way uh, that we would want them to, but I, you know, we used to give out like the harm reduction packs and somebody would throw all this information, you know, on their, ki on their kitchen table. And then later on down the road, they, they'd open it up and they'd find, Hey, a pamphlet for, you know, a turning point center or another resource. And they would, they would reach out for help. So they might not in the moment, but they might down the road. Um, as we said, as long as they're alive, they could, they have the potential to get help. So um, it's just trying to get that in their hands as many ways as we can. Oh, well, thank both of you for your answers. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very so. much. Um, uh, I did want to take a break. As you see, we have not been able to get Kaya Morris on. She, um, she just signed off and she can join us shortly after 2.30. Um, Selena, I'm not sure. Um, can your question wait until after the break? Yeah, I can I can hold my question for another time. Just period. In the interest of making sure we hear from other witnesses. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure if we're going to get to uh, Mr. Diaz. We are on the floor at three, so let's take a um, quick break and come back in about ten minutes, about twenty five up, so we can make sure that we hear from our representative Kaya Morris. Thank you. Thank you. 